Good evening, everybody. Welcome along to the uh, almost 500, actually, of you participants who've joined us for tonight's webinar and the viewers who might be watching this podcast at a, at a later stage. Um, just going to open up the Mental Health Professionals Network. Uh, always wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands across Australia which are, upon which our webinar presenters and participants are, are located in that, and with that. We certainly do wish to pay respect to the elders, past, present and emerging, for the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Indigenous Australia. We always hope that we can do the very best we can to, to honour that, uh, that respect. Uh, I'm Conrad Cungar, I'm a Rural General Practitioner in Crossapine in North Queensland. And it's great to welcome you all back to the, the next of the, the series uh, on telehealth and delivery of mental health services for those who might not be in the metropolitan area. So once again, I'm your facilitator for, for tonight's session. Um, these sessions really are a, a key. They're, they're some of the most popular ones that uh, NHBN has, has been doing because there's no doubt that we have got so many patients who need our help who can't always get to access face-to-face -face support at the time that they, they need it. So the more people who are familiar with and, and comfortable with utilisation of telehealth, the, the better off we're going to, going to be. Um, but I've done plenty of these uh, of these talks with NHBN before. We've got a, a fantastic panel with us again tonight uh, as well. So when you uh, when you registered in, hopefully you already saw the, the bios for for everybody who we've, we've got. Uh, but we won't go through all of those again. We'll uh, we'll just go we'll go straight to our actual panelists. Um, just going to introduce Jacinta Bell, uh, occupational therapist. Uh, Jacinta, would you encourage your occupational therapist colleagues to use telehealth for their clients? Uh, hi Conrad, uh, thanks for the nice introduction and yes definitely, uh, simple answer is yes I would. Um, uh, really people in rural areas already have very minimal access to um, our profession um, and telehealth is a, is a fantastic opportunity to be able to increase access for people in those areas. It's very, very normal for occupational therapists to see people in their home environment anyway. That's a very common thing that we would do. Um, and so telehealth is really a great opportunity to um, be invited into somebody's home potentially um, and, and get to incorporate the environmental context within any of our uh, therapies that we're doing. Um, it really works well for interventions that aren't hands-on and a lot of the mental health interventions that we do uh, uh, fit very well within that category. Um, and the, and um, it means that we can always ensure that the environmental context is considered in our therapy. Depending on the device that people are using, sometimes I've even had people show me around their home um, via telehealth um, if they're using their phone or you know handheld device. That's really, really quite fantastic um, and, and very, very effective. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Thanks for, thanks for that, Jacinta. Next, I'm going to move on to uh, Dr. Louise Ruffell. Louise is the uh, the manager of, psych of professional services for the Australian <coughs> Psychologist Society. Louise, welcome along uh, back to the, the, the session here tonight. Louise, what do you see are the benefits of telehealth for those Australians living in new and remote areas? Thanks, Conrad. Uh, it's lovely to be here tonight for everyone. and. My background is 20 years of practice in rural and remote Australia, so it's an absolute joy that we finally have access um, or improved access to psychological services through telehealth. It's obviously not going to be for everyone, but having seen the, the lack of access to psychological services in rural and remote Australia, it's going to give at least some people a much greater chance of not having to travel. Um, if there's a choice there, that doesn't mean they have to travel so far um, to access services. Um, it, it's an enormous bonus. So it's, it's, it's improved the chances that GPs have got to provide services to their to their clients. Right, that's wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Louise. Uh, we're also now welcoming back Julianne White. Julianne's a, a social worker. Uh, she's been practicing in the area for for a long time, and uh, has great experience in here. Julianne, what would you say would be one of the key benefits of using telehealth for, for a social worker? Oh, look, thanks, Conrad. And it's wonderful, like everyone else has said, to be here again tonight. I think this is a really great issue. Um, the benefits for social work, as like all the other professions, is that 
One, we're giving people choice, um, access. Um, GPs can then find clinicians that have got particular expertise that they might be looking for for a client and I think it's just improving the range of services that we can do and, and also with the clients that really do struggle, those that can come in occasionally but you know, there's other difficulties with you know, weather, transport, um, commitments on farms which is one of the problems we've got around harvest and cropping. Often people can't travel the 30 or 40 kilometres in for sessions. Then we can do a beautiful mix of sessions with people and but we've used it a lot and I really love the um, opportunities and the flexibility this gives for people. So I highly recommend it, not just for social workers but for all mental health clinicians. But social workers, they're a bit like what um, Jacinta was saying about seeing the person in the context which from our profession is also a very important consideration. So I highly recommend every social worker here to um, get on board, it's a great initiative. Oh wonderful, thanks Julianne. And finally we welcome Dr Jonathan Ho. Jonathan's a, a general practitioner in Wagga Wagga uh, and welcome along to the, uh, to the, the panel tonight Jonathan. Wondering mate, uh, in your work with Indigenous people, have you found telehealth a useful tool? Hi Conrad, um, yes uh, I work with the Wiradjuri community and um, I'm based in Wagga Wagga. Um, in that community, they're fluent in English, they're familiar with technology, similar to Skype or FaceTime. I really think that telepsychology could benefit in two aspects. One is confidentiality and with the Aboriginal community, everyone's business is everyone's business. So if say you don't want Uncle Phil to know that you're going to have a chat with a psychologist today, telepsychology could be flexible enough to say do the initial sessions over the mobile phone. The second thing is um, accessibility. Um, with the community I work with, there's lots of complexities that inhibit a patient to attend appointments. Like it could be as easy as practical matters, such as uh, not being able to uh, find transport, um, or uh, having young children to look after, or not being able to get up um, early enough to go to an appointment. So tele a psychology could cater for these patients, and hence capture a client base that may otherwise fall through the gaps. Great, great thoughts. Thanks, thanks Jonathan and welcome that along. So to those of you who may not have been uh, previous participants in the MHPN webinars, just go through a, a few of the, the ground rules and, and what we we're doing with, with these. Remember that we, yeah, this is a large event, we've got uh, almost 700 people actually on, online now or already. So it is very difficult to make sure that everybody gets equal access and, and opportunity. So please, to, to make sure that everybody has the, the best experience tonight. Be respectful of other participants and, and the panelists. Uh, although it's, they're all quite anonymous in this area, make sure that you're acting as though you were in, in the same room. If you are choosing to, to interact with each other, please use the chat box facility that we've, we've got there. But just try to make sure that you keep those comments uh, relevant and on topic. Uh, if you've actually got technical issues that you're, that you're having a problem, uh, you might be able to, to better off put those into uh, that area as, as well. But we've also got the technical support frequently asked questions tab at the top there. So you might find that you can find a, a quicker resolution to your problem by clicking on, on that area. Uh, of course, if you're still struggling, the 1800 291 863 number will be active throughout the webinar. So give them a call if, you, if you're still requiring additional support. Um, remember though that you know, we've got a, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of people on, online. If there is actually something which affects the, the quality of the transmission, we'll, we'll make sure that we let you know about it at, at the time of our, our announcement. And also remember that it's very difficult to get through everybody's questions and comments in the, the course of, of this evening. Uh, but we'll try to make sure that we, we get through as much as we, as we can. Uh, at the end of the webinar, please also make sure that you take the, the time to complete the, uh, the feedback survey which will be located under a tab at the, at the top of the screen there for you. So we'll be making sure that we try to get through as much of the content that you'd uh, previously uh, supplied with the, with the registration. There was an overwhelming number of, of questions that, that came in which was a, a great sign of the, the interest that everybody's got. It's a very, very broad area of, uh, of topics that we're going to try to cover tonight. So Please, we will do our very, very best to, to cover off on uh, what you've been asking. Um, but um, our greatest apologies if you if we don't if you feel as though we don't get particularly to to yours. So let's just have a revisit through the, the learning outcomes for for this evening's session. Um, 
remembering that we're willing to use these opportunities really to find out for our patients who are in rural and remote areas, what might telehealth be able to, to do for those? Uh, how can we better recognise those clients who might be suitable for delivery of services via mental health, mental health, telehealth zone? Identifying some of the risks associated with telehealth services, but also getting some of those real practical logistical points about developing <coughs> contingency plans, looking after privacy, making sure we've got informed consent, training your staff appropriately, and record keeping for the tele telehealth setting. So let's move on to our introductory session. So as I mentioned at the, uh, the start, this is number two in the, in the, the series for, for telehealth. Uh, Department of Health have been kind enough to, to fund a, another webinar. But that means that this is a build on to the initial webinar which was uh, hosted last year. We're not going to be able to revisit all of that content. So please, I'd encourage anybody who hasn't yet re reviewed uh, webinar one, make sure you do keep an eye on, on that, that link and, and do go back and have a look over that podcast if you feel though tonight you might not have got all of the, all of the content because we're just not going to have the opportunity to, to revisit all of that, that content. Although we are talking about telehealth, we just remember that we're not just talking about the telephone. It's not just an audio connection that's, that's indicated with this service. But just as we're tonight using audio and visual in the same way if you're using telehealth for a delivery of mental health services, it needs to do with both of those modalities, audio and visual. This initiative is, uh, is appropriate for those health, mental, health, uh, mental health care professionals who are registered with Medicare. So if you're an occupational therapist, social worker or psychologist, you certainly are eligible. Make sure you've got that registration up to date. If you're having any difficulties with uh, understanding the eligibility or the, the conditions that go around it, uh, make sure you have a look through the Department of Health or the Australian Psychological Society website. They've got some fantastic information and resources there that you'll be able to, to use. And a reminder that the clients who we're talking about in this modality are those who are living in remote or rural and remote Australia. So modified Monash model, MMM 4 to 7. If you're unsure about if the area you're living in or where your clients are coming from uh, satisfies that criteria, the link is, is there also for you to be able to, to access what's, what's going on. But re remember that what we're wanting to, to build with these webinar sessions is really being able to work out how can different mental health professionals collaborate with each other. It's not about what all of us bring individually, but really how working for the, for the best as a, as a team or as a group of as health professionals, we really can be, be looking after the, the, the team the best that we can. Now just remember that in that MMM criteria, it's your clients who need to be in that remote area. You, you yourself don't necessarily have to be in a remote area at, at all. So let's, uh, let's move on then to how might we be able to determine the suitability of the, of the patients who we're going to be looking at. Um, Julianne, I, I wonder what sort of experience, what do you think, uh, what types of therapy might be most suited to, to the telehealth setting? Uh, thanks, Conrad. Yeah, I think there's a variety of therapies that are really suitable for telehealth. Um, some of the very intensive ones may not be, you know, if you're doing some intense mindfulness or trying to engage with, you know, reduction of distress might be tricky. But I think an awful lot of the narrative therapies, cognitive therapies, um, some of the behavioural therapies, neuroscience type of responses works extremely well with people and I find people engage extremely well with the technology, especially even talking about deep and meaningful situations or things that are happening for them. So there's a range of therapies and I think that's part of that uh, assessment of the client at the beginning as to how they are uh, presenting on the day and what might be happening for them. I think that's really important to assess to start with. But I think there's a range of therapies that we should continue. I don't think we should exclude any because if a client has a need, I think we've got a, telehealth as a vehicle, then we should probably try and find, as clinicians, the best way to provide an appropriate therapy for that person. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Julianne. Uh, Louise, um, have you got any additional thoughts about what might be appropriate therapies uh, for, for telehealth? 
Thanks, Conrad. I agree with um, Julianne that there's probably not that many specific therapies that are excluded. I guess the only thing I might add is some behavioural interventions, particularly that need to be fairly frequent and perhaps need to be um, done in conjunction face to face if it's um, a particular exposure or that requires you to be face to face. That might not be suitable for um, as a therapeutic approach done by telehealth, but it still lets you combine the two. So remember it's only seven of the ten sessions that can be by telehealth. So it can often be a mix of face to face and telehealth that can let you do even the more complex therapies that require you to you to be face to face. Hmm. Yeah, well and truly. I suppose some of the, the concerns that we might have in, in identifying the, the suitability of our, our patients for telehealth interventions is what happens if, if we think that they're not really dealing with their, their diagnosis or that they're needing that, that little bit of extra support? Um, just I'm just thinking that for, for those patients who we might think are particularly anxious, how would you deal with your anxious anxious clients in the, the telehealth setting? Thanks, Conrad. Um, certainly, people who are anxious, my experience has been, um, and other people might have different experiences, um, that actually telehealth is a is a great um, avenue to overcome that initial anxiety. Um, because people can be working within their own uh, environment where they are often comfortable um, and feeling quite safe. So to engage initially in um, therapy via telehealth, that can be quite, uh, uh, I guess it can remove one of the barriers to accessing um, therapy for people who are very anxious. Um, I would say one of the other things that we would look to do is make sure that we've had uh, quite a bit of communication prior to the uh, to the first telehealth appointment, where we are setting up uh, the scene so that people know exactly what to expect, um, and there's not going to be any surprises for them. Um, that's going to alleviate as much of that anxiety as we possibly can. Mm. Yeah, well, well and truly, you know, bring 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 all of those issues out into the open early, and, and making sure that we, we deal with them explicitly rather than just assume that everything's going along fine is, is really, really important. Of course, Julianne, sometimes our, our patients are a little bit more at risk than, uh, than, than anxiety and we might have serious concerns about their, their, their welfare. Um, would, it, would it affect your consideration about their suitability for, for telehealth if you knew or if you suspected that the client was self-harming? Um, Conrad, I think when we're, when we're seeing people that are in a really severe state of anxiety or self-harming, as you say, we need to really stay focused on what the client's need are. And if they can't get in to see someone that day or can't access the service, then I think we as clinicians have to make sure we provide an appropriate service. And I think we can really engage with people well with telehealth. You know, when you practice the technology, I really encourage clinicians to practice with their their screens or their phones, whatever vehicle they use, so that you can really, you know, get the eye contact, practice our micro skills, learn to use your voice to engage with an anxious client really well and not be frightened by this technology. Like even on the screen, you know, the way we use our heads or, you know, how close or far we are can make a huge difference to someone who's anxious. It's about meeting the need now rather than saying, sorry, you know, sorry, um, bad luck, you can't get to anywhere. I think it's about us being, um, before we offer tele, uh, telehealth to anybody, be really comfortable with the technology first and know how we can offer our best service to people because it's clients that matter. That's that's right and, and this really is, is a great example of making sure that we're actually putting the needs of our client mm -hmm. at, the, at the, the front of, of what we're, we're doing because you're, you're absolutely right that the, the fewer barriers that we, we put in to, into place to, to them getting the help that they need really is so very important. Louise, are there any other uh, important principles about client suitability that you, you think? Are there any other factors that we should be considering here? You know, perhaps, and particularly also if we're collaborating with other health professionals about a, a common client 
utilising telehealth. I think what I agree again with what Julianne said, Conrad, that um, if you've got a client who perhaps is um, at risk of self-harm or even at risk of harming someone else, telehealth doesn't necessarily um, mean you can't see them. Um, it might mean that you need to give some serious thought before you start therapy and setting it up about how you can um, wrap around the client some of the risk management strategies that you might do in a normal face-to-face -face session. So it may mean that before you start that you work with the client to uh, understand who the, the support people could be. If Normally if you've got a client at risk of harming themselves then um, the client's there in front of you and you can um, get much better clues perhaps than what you might from telehealth even using the strategies that Julianne suggested. You can get a, um, a good idea face to face of what's going on. It can be trickier um, when you can see them online but that you can certainly put in place some strategies around them. You can work with, the, as you said, the, the uh, referring GP, other services where the client might be living um, to, to put in place some safety procedures around that, around that client. Hmm. Thanks, thanks, Louise. Jonathan, of course, as GPs, you know, we're, we're more accustomed to, I suppose, always keeping a holistic view of, of what's happening for our, our patients. Uh, even apart from just the, the diagnostic issues, there, what, what might be some of the, the sort of the, the practical issues that you think might uh, might mean that a patient might be more uh, that telehealth might be a really good option for, for them for their care. Yeah, so um, I see in a, a lot of patients who are, um, are rural and uh, a lot of them have um, uh, jobs which, you know, they have to work nine to five, um, inflexible bosses, they might have to uh, look after uh, young children, transportation issues. So having that flexibility of accessing a service that could actually work for them uh, rather than that they have to fit into um, the service could, could, could be... Um, uh, one thing that I will identify for uh, suitability for uh, telepsychology. Um, uh, the other thing is um, sometimes um, as a GP, you might actually identify that uh, people need um, uh, tele uh, sorry need psychology, but maybe a specific type, or actually the patient wants a specific type of um, intervention, whether it's say DBT or trauma counselling or something like that. Having telepsychology, where you have access to uh, different clinicians and uh, where you can just um, use the technology to um, uh, um, uh, engage, uh, to, to link the patient with the clinician um, is, is, is a benefit. So Jacinta, so just thinking about, you've been doing uh, these, these treatments for, for a while, just thinking about what sort of what, what, what have you found actually works as far as the, the, the suitability? So uh, are there particular professionals who you think might be as you think about this? Um, I, in terms of what works, uh, most of the work I do tends to be with people who have chronic pain. And I can say that telehealth is an absolutely fantastic avenue for working with people in that category because travel for them is very, very difficult. And I see a lot of people who have got um, chronic pain via telehealth even though we live in the same uh, area. So obviously it's not under this particular program but um, uh, as well as people in rural areas. Um, the only thing I think that is a bit challenging for our profession is that quite often we do um, therapy which involves us doing things with a person um, and that's, that's a little bit more difficult. So like Louise said earlier, those uh, three of those ten sessions that need to be face to face might be the times in which you're doing those those um, strategies. But so, for example, if we're doing graded exposure um, in a shopping centre, often we would go with people to do that. Um, so it it there's there's some limitations, but I think overall there are always ways that we can find to work around uh, and make it work for people so that they can access the service. Like PC telehealth has been. Um, I really uh, can actually reduce some of the barriers to access for um, people with some populations, not just rural and remote, but also people with anxiety and chronic pain. 
And Louisa, of course, that there are some other practical issues there as well. And, and we remember that the, this first session does have to be face to face. Yeah, absolutely right, there, Jacinta. That we can't do all of the the, the services over over telehealth. But Louise, what might be some of the other issues that you want to address in that first session, just on deciding whether the, the subsequent uh, sessions can be via telehealth? I think for, for some clinicians, Conrad, that um, we, we focus a lot on whether the, the symptomatology of the client is suitable for telehealth. You know, are they um, the sorts of treatment they may need suitable? Are they um, are there issues about risk or anxiety that that might not suit, or is the symptomatology too severe to be managed by distance? But I think we also need to remember that um, the technology can be a, a barrier to access for some clients. Um, whilst you know, access to a phone or to a, a, some sort of device might be uh, might is not always possible for all clients. And I think the other big issue is the cost of the data usage. Um, that, that the client might incur in um, a 50 minute, regular 50 minute session. Um, but it's not impossible to even get around that. So um, it, it's certainly possible to work with referring GPs to find alternative places that the client can go to. And while that's probably not going to be the local public library because there's not a lot of confidentiality there, there may be access through a, um, a, a multi purpose clinic or some sort of. Um, Rural um, clinic service that's got access to to a telehealth facility to, that the client can can go to in a private room. So um, even when there seems to be barriers around technology, there there can be solutions if you work with the the local referring doctor and the client. Yes, that's right. You know, and and those those types of areas. I really do have to be considered. You do sometimes have to keep a bit of a, a lateral mindset on on how you're approaching. How might you be best able to facilitate this uh, this care for our for our, our patients? John, of course, you know Louisa just mentioned that sometimes you might need to use one of the, the local health services uh, in in the area who might be able to facilitate the, the visit. And we we certainly know that that keeping the the GPs uh, who are the you know the, the, the primary provider, the primary um, referrers. Uh, engaged can sometimes be a little bit difficult. Um, one of the, the other issues that we have, of course, is following up with, the, with the, the, the patients, making sure that we're keeping up with what's actually going on for them. Julianne, uh, you know, I think that you've probably had a, a few tried and, and trusted processes that you found been really useful for assisting with checking in with how your clients are going along. Would you be happy to share some of those? Yeah, thanks Conrad. Yes, I would be. And I've also got a few resources that we're um, <clears throat> happy to provide for people around um, checklists and um, processes that we've got at Amaranth. So happy to do that for people. But yeah, we, we've actually got a, a whole of an organisation approach whereby our administrative, you know, once it's been organised with the client, through the clinician and through the GP. Um, so usually if I get a referral, I'll ring the GP and have a chat to the GP or we ring the client to get an appointment. And we discuss the opportunity for telehealth. As the client says, "Oh gosh, you know, it's a bit far to go. I don't know when I can have an appointment." And so we'll actually discuss with them what we're doing. But then I hand it over to my admin team, who will then do the checks with the person. And we've got a checklist that, um, which is called our telehealth. You know, we've got a consent form. We've got um, checklist to see, you know, whether they've got the right environment. So we go through. A, a quite a comprehensive list of things with the person and do a bit of a trial first whether they're choosing a computer as a platform or their phone as a platform. We've done an awful lot of work, especially after hours, using um, phones and FaceTime as a very um, really lovely, easy, convenient thing to use. But we always do a check with people first and make sure that they're happy with the technology, they're happy with us, that we can hear each other properly. And that's where we negotiate these things about privacy and the, you know, what if the call drops out? Is there a second number we can ring them on? And um, the thing is that we always ring the client first, so we don't rely on them to ring us. We make sure we say, look, we'll ring you five minutes before our you know, allocated time just to make sure you're okay. Or we text message them a reminder, don't forget you've got a telehealth with Julianne or another clinician tonight. Um, and our engagement with people is really good. The other thing we do do is we contact them after the session 
um, either the next day or sometime, you know, very, you know, within 24 hours, just to see were they happy with the session, more from a practical perspective, you know, were there problems with it, um, did they feel that they were listened to, did they want to do it again, was it really useful for them? And we actually collect that data as one of our quality processes. And then we review them at a monthly meeting, you know, how do we go with these clients, is it something we want to continue? So, um, um, yeah, I think that's, hope that answers. <laughs> Oh well, well and truly, Julianne. And in, in, in fact, Julianne's been kind enough to to share some of those resources and, and the the, uh, the templates that she's been referring to. Uh, you'll be able to find it under the resources tab. Um, so they'll certainly help out for, for a lot of other participants tonight. Thanks a lot, for that, Julianne. Um, Jonathan, you know what what might be some of the other ways that the, you find that GPs can better engage those uh, those patients who we think are suitable for, for telehealth. Yeah, um, just like what Julianne said, um, I think the GP would really appreciate learning a little bit more um, about the process of um, telepsychology. Um, for a GP, I think it's still quite a new thing, and you can only imagine that a GP actually has to learn so many things because uh, you know we're supposed to be um, um, you know, experts in life. So um, mental health is just one very small part of all of the information um, that we get overloaded with. Um, I think uh, GPs like to be part of um, the professional community. We like to work with other health professionals, whether they're psychologists or social workers or um, uh, um, you know, uh, counsellors in allied health. Um, we actually appreciate having a phone call from you or an email from you. Um, we might be so busy that you know, um, you'll have to leave a phone message, but um, we, we, want, we want to be engaged and um, it's an opportunity that you can actually educate us um, on uh, what's the best way to uh, help um, a patient um, seek, um, uh, uh, seek, seek, seek treatment. Um, the other thing that I think is um, the GP has sort of um, this continuity of care. Like, for example, a clinician might only see um, a patient for 10 sections, uh, ses um, sessions, but a GP might actually see that patient for 10 years. So um, uh, ideally, the GP can say in a non-threatening way, in non-interrogating -in way, ask them how, say, their first or second session went. Um, and for me, I always find that the patient gives me an interesting snippet. Um, uh, it, it could be something, say, oh, the sound quality wasn't very good, or how they found how the rapport went. And I really don't think that this information is a duplicate. I'm sure um, as a clinician or the administrator might ask these questions. But it's more collaborative to see things from a different angle. And sometimes patients are so polite that they probably won't tell you guys what's really going on, but they feel comfortable in order to share it with the GP. Yeah, that's that's a, a really, really valuable insight there, Jonathan. You, we, we do tend to sometimes take our role for, for granted that for a lot of the time, yeah, we might actually be your eyes and ears. Um, that if you're only seen the client maybe once or twice as a face-to-face -face visit. And it may be, you know, four or six weeks since you actually last saw them in person. Uh, that there might be times that you might need, you might feel as though if you just give the, the GP a, a call or, a, or get in contact, you can just check up with us about what else might have been happening in, in the meantime. You know, that might there be something that we can follow up with you when you when the, they're next coming in for a script or. or, or Something. So, yeah, that, that's absolutely right, Jonathan. It, it, it's not just the relationship between the mental health professional and the client, but you really can build a useful care team with this telehealth initiative there as well. Of course, we, we know that it's it's not just the initial engagement, is it? Um, we really need to make sure that we've got that that longevity. Uh, to you know, we know that the, the GP is necessary for, for that part of it. Um, you know, how else do you think, Jonathan, that the, that the GP might be able to, uh, you know, get that initial engagement going well for the client? Um, sometimes I find that the clients can be overwhelmed with information, and if they are talking to someone who initially is not familiar um, to them, they might might not be so able to get all the information. Just simply practical things. They might forget that some of the sessions have to be face to face after, say, the first one. And um, having um, GPs who know about the process 
and engaged with the process can actually help facilitate the patient to um, uh, um, like be reminded of how the process goes. Um, as an analogy, um, I see GPs as sort of like the coach, but also the cheerleader. We're the ones that um, have the rapport with the patients and can help them kind of like continue on with the process. Um, some patients might see 10 sessions um, as quite a long um, journey, or, me, or like say like even a marathon. So having that GP to encourage them and cheer, cheerlead them on, um, I, I think is really important. Um, so I think that's why um, GPs should actually be engaged themselves by um, with your help, so that um, we can actually um, all facilitate the same thing for the patient to have longevity through the process. And Louise, we've been talking about what types of, of therapies we, we might be going into, and, and some of them are quite specific and, and, and might be quite foreign to, to our, our clients. Uh, you know, what, what would you think that uh, the, the, the GP adds for, for those clients? I th I certainly from my experience in remote Australia where there are very few psychologists or social workers or, or OTs, um, there isn't a community understanding really of what psychological therapy is about. As, as Jonathan said, the sort of 10 hour long sessions talking to someone over a device seems very very um, unusual and pretty scary when um, no one you know has done that before. This is a very new service. So to have a GP who can um, encourage a client that um, you know it's, it's a chat, it's not scary, that the therapist will be guided by you, um, you know, that it's normal to feel anxious and it will get easier, easier and um, it's okay to tell them how you're feeling can be really um, encouraging for a client who's really got no concept of what psychological therapy is, let alone psychological therapy over, over a device. And the GP, in my experience, with, um, with, with any sort of psychological therapy, even when it was myself or my colleagues face to face, made an enormous difference if it was the three of us all working together, the client, the GP and myself. And I think it's even more important when it's telehealth. Yeah. Agree wholeheartedly there with you on, on that, Louise. Of course, it's not always straightforward. It, it, there's a, a lot of, well, I suppose, a lot of risks that we have to face as well with, with what happens with telehealth. We know that we've got a, a group of patients who it's not the ideal setting for us. We don't have them there in our consulting room with us as well. So there are, I, I suppose, some risks that we do need to, to overcome uh, with delivery of mental health services via telehealth. Uh, Jacinta, would you be happy to to address maybe what your strategies might be with some of these? Thanks, Ahmed. Um, definitely. Um, I have talked a lot about risk in the initial um, uh, webinar. If people get to have a look at that, um, but but look, some of the main risks that people face um, for us as providers is um, we have a, a less maybe a more limited ability to undertake a comprehensive mental state exam um, via telehealth. Um, and sometimes there can be increased frustrations for the, for the client. Um, if there are lags or if there's interruptions in the technology, that can really interfere with the um, therapeutic relationship um, and, and our ability to do the assessment. Um, so it is really good to have contingencies for if that happens. Um, and uh, so, for example, you might say uh, do the video link over the um, over your platform. However, you might actually speak over the phone so that you're not um, you're not limited in your conversation if the if the screen freezes and you need to sort of work on that. Um, and that can really help to build uh, rapport and reduce frustration. Um, other risks, of course, um, you know, are I guess people are more likely to disclose um, deep distress. Possibly, they might feel more comfortable to do that in this type of environment, um, or or suicidal ideation, and that can be quite confronting for the um, or more a little bit more difficult to manage as the as the provider or the, the clinician. 
Um, so when, we, when we're dealing with that risk, we really want to make sure that we have mitigated the risk as much as possible prior to the appointment. So the sorts of things that you would do in your initial assessment, which I like to do that one face-to-face -face if, if possible, um, because then we can do a really thorough risk assessment and make a plan around any potential self-harm or suicidal um, behaviour or potential crises <coughs> and get the client's agreement on that plan um, so that you've got something to enact should anything happen. Um, and it's really important to also make sure that the, the client's very well informed about limitations within the session to confidentiality um, that arise through uh, electronic communication um, and that they have uh, a contribution to make in terms of privacy, their own keeping, protecting their own privacy. Um, and that might include things like um, making sure that they're in a room with a door that closes um, so that if there are other people in the house, they're not listening in on their, on their conversation. So it's very, very important to um, not scare people, you know, um, get them to understand the process. This is just a simple face-to-face, -face, um, like, a, like a simple face-to-face -face consult, except over the internet. Um, and make sure that they're prepared and you've, you've planned for any, any risks so that you can mitigate that as much as possible. That's enough for me. <laughs> Absolutely, Jacinta. You're right. Yeah. I, I remember us going through all of that in the, the first webinar and thinking, wow, yeah, there's so much to, to think about through all of this as well and, and certainly some of those practical points. Julianne, you've been doing this for, for a while as, as well. How do you manage some of the, the risks in, involved with delivery of mental health services by telehealth? Oh, thanks, Conrad. Yeah, and look, and thank you, Jacinta. That was really, really fantastic what you said, and I think I totally agree with her. That it's really critical um, whether you have the first session face to face or you don't get that luxury to actually. <clears throat> and I really worry sometimes that we clients may think we're wasting their valuable time if we take up too much time doing checklists and checking, you know, making sure everything's safe and perfect. Uh, honestly, we've done we've done some therapy when a guy's been out in his tractor you know, sort of out in the paddock and we, it was an unexpected, we just had to go with the flow. And, you know, we did all the risk assessments beforehand and, you know, just said, look, you've got to be in a room, make sure it's nice and safe and it's quiet. Look, sometimes it's just about being where the client is, which is sometimes we have to be ready to uh, respond as, as, as um, ethically and appropriately, I think, as we can. Um, but we do have in one of the documents I've provided is a pathway, a checklist for telehealth sessions and I use this with every session. We put it in the file and I tick through it, you know, consider the appropriateness, make sure all the information's been given. We've got a, a little leaflet that we give it to people to start with that might have key questions to ask. Um, we ask them to, you know, try and speak naturally, try and just you know, overview of what they what they will expect. Um, we do exactly what we do in a face to face session, but it's a little bit more um, condensed perhaps. I'm really mindful too about how much of the person or how much of myself I try to show on the screen. So we're just not doing headshots, we're trying to get a body so that they can see that I'm more than just a shoulders and a head, that I've got arms and legs and, and I encourage them to show a bit more of their body so that we feel there's more of a, con oh, I don't know if that's got to do with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a bit about, it's a risk if they don't feel they know you and can feel comfortable with you. and. I'm conscious of you know all those other things around I you know animation and like I would in a session, but I do really use this pathway checklist with people, and I feel that um, it, it prevents me from forgetting things, um, and that we cover things off with the person so that we we go over things like making sure um, you know there's no other people in the room if you want privacy, or if they do want a support person, who's that support person? Um, how do I contact them between sessions? A big thing too is to make sure they know what to do to check in with you after the session because I think a lot of people feel that because it's telehealth that they can contact us by messenger or through Snapchat or Facebook. Um, so I think it's really important to also ensure that um, they're very mindful about what you do expect and what not to expect as well because I've had quite a few people then text me because I use my own mobile phone if I'm doing FaceTime or I'm texting them to remind them and I use my mobile phone as a backup. 
people then will contact me after hours. So I'm very mindful now of um, ensuring that that's covered and people understand my expectations or what I will um, expect from them and vice versa. Yeah, definitely, and and the and, and certainly having those those contacts in place really is so very important. That it is it is ideal to to try to make this as natural as you can to remember that all of those same concepts, the importance of nonverbal language and, and communication, uh, are just as important as ever. Just on Friday, I had a, a, a situation where. The, uh, the psychologist, one of my patients, had to keep our patient on the phone talking, talking, talking while she was then trying to get in contact with the, the mother who was 150 kilometres away and bring my surgery, trying to get a, an urgent appointment for, for that afternoon because of concerns she'd had about his, uh, his, his condition. Um, so yeah, obviously there there's, there's really is make sure you've got all of those contacts and all of those uh, parts of the puzzle in place early so that if you do find there's actually some, um, some, some concerns going on, you're not scrambling at the, at the last minute trying to explain it all to triple zero on just what might, be, what might be going on. Of course, Louise, there's some other concerns that we, we might have uh, as well and, uh, and Julianne's quite rightly put out that and we have to make sure that we're, we're delivering the, the best service that we can in a way that, that's appropriate to, to our, our, our patients. Um, what might be some of the other issues if we're not providing a service, if we decide that this is too hard and that we're not, not proceeding with it? Thanks, Thanks Conrad. Um, just before I answer that, I was just going to pick up too on um, what Julianne said about, um, and and Jacinta about um, managing the risk too, that it can really be helpful each time you do a telehealth session to um, ask the client where they are because we can't assume they're always in the same location when it's telehealth. So, and I think your example, Conrad, was a good one that um, you know the, the, the client, um, you're having to chase people up from a distance. Well, if the client's not where you think they are, it can be very hard to get um, emergency services to the client. So sometimes it helps at the beginning of each session to say, you know, where are, where are you today? Because it might not be the same place as it was the last session. Um, but I just wanted to pick up on something Julianne had said earlier on too about sometimes there can be more risk in um, not providing a rural client with a, with a service. And, it's often a real um, conundrum for psychologists working in um, with clients in rural and remote Australia because um, you need to give a lot of thought um, that you're not going to put a client at risk and sometimes the, um, the ethical dilemmas in taking clients on that are high risk when you're a long way away from that client seem insurmountable but often of course when there's no other option but the psychologist or the OT or the social worker via telehealth that puts the client at more risk um, than if they've not had a, a service at all. So I, I agree with Julianne's point earlier on that sometimes it's a matter of working very closely with the GP, with the support people that um, the client may have, um, finding out who their supports are, what the crisis services, the phone numbers of them in their local region um, and other services in that region because sometimes um, the risk is mitigated by you providing it even though it might seem high risk at the beginning. And Louise, of course we're, we're talking about client settings and client locations that, that might change and that in fact they, these clients might not necessarily be in the, the same um, state as, as you. What would be some of the, the cross-border legislation issues relevant to mental health professionals uh, working in you know, using mental health uh, services in telehealth? It's certainly possible of course with telehealth that the provider and the client are in a different state. It might even be that um, uh, you know the client moves during the course of treatment and, and, and moves into state so you do have a client not in the same state or territory as where you are as the, as the clinician. And 
there's a whole lot of different legislation, of course, that, that um, all of us therapists need to comply with. Um, and we're all very familiar with the legislation pertinent to us in our particular state and the national legislation. And for private practitioners, that's the Privacy Act, the National Privacy Act. But there's also state and territory legislation. And of course, if you're in one state and the client's in another, then you've got a tricky legal situation. Um, and I think clearly around some, some of those issues around Health Records Act, because some of the states have um, different Health Records Acts and there's variation in what um, you may be required to do in terms of the clinical records. Um, but of course, mandatory reporting is the other area where there's going to be, um, for good or for bad, as the Royal Commission's identified, there are state-based differences in mandatory reporting. Um, and I just thought the example I would, would give you is, if you're not in Victoria, if you're not practising in Victoria, you're probably not aware of a relatively new um, legislation in Victoria that requires all adults to report any incidents of a um, or any reasonable belief that they may have, so acquired in the course of telehealth, that a person in Victoria at, uh, who was under the age of 16 at the time um, had um, been um, uh, had a sexual offence committed against them by a person over the age of 18. And that has to be reported to the police by any adult, including um, psycho providers of psychological services. So if your client's in Victoria and you're seeing that client from New South Wales or any other state, you need to be aware of that, that requirement. So it, if you're going to do interstate work, you need to be very careful and um, to understand the legal implications of wherever you're providing services to. Well and truly. And of, of course, the, the security of the, the platform that we're utilising is uh, as a major concern as well that, that many of our participants tonight have, have been asking about. Uh, just in terms of, have you found there's particular platforms which you know, uh, are, there, are there concerns about security of, of platforms that you've come across at all? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is just from my own perspective, not speaking on anyone's behalf here, um, but, but we offer our clients um, an option of Zoom or Skype as their, as their platforms and we inform them about some of the risks that are associated. And I believe that Zoom meets all of the requirements of the APS um, but for telehealth and Skype does not quite meet them. What we find practically is that people prefer Skype and will choose to use Skype even though they're aware that there might be more privacy concerns around Skype simply because they're familiar with it and and people are more likely to use things, want to use things that they're familiar with. Um, so we try to mitigate our own risk there by making sure that people have um, informed consent and, and will um, sign a consent form um, saying that they're aware of the risks and they want to proceed with using that platform. Um, but in a practical sense, that's what people are choosing um, from within our practice anyway. Hmm. So yeah, actually uh, some of the, the, the participants certainly have been, been asking about, about that area. Now of course, Jonathan, we've, we've mentioned that you know, as, as the GPs, we, we are sometimes there to, to fill in the gaps and to maybe follow up with our, our patients about how they're progressing with their, with their, their care. What, what happens if we find that it's actually not working all that well? What, what do we do then? I find that um, having a chat with a patient to explore um, what um, I guess their concerns are or what their issues are. It could just be um, one example, um, Doc, um, uh, I uh, just had my session and I go, how was it? And he said it was amazing but awful at the same time. And I go, oh, what do you mean? <laughs> well, um, you know, it was uh, trauma therapy and uh, is exactly what he wanted, but it was just so overwhelming. And uh, just for him, he just wanted to stretch out the appointments a little bit more, um, and, but he didn't know actually how to do that. Um, uh, and as a GP, you can actually facilitate that and maybe just make the call with the patient's consent 
um, to um, wh whoever is uh, doing the sessions and say, oh, could we maybe stretch the, um, um, the, the appointments out a little bit, um, which actually improves, um, well, well, decreases dropout rate and re improves their ability to continue on with their sessions. Um, the other things that um, you can think of is, uh, um, I guess, um, a lot of a lot of patients actually tell me, "Oh, look, um, we just didn't get on." And when you sort of explore that, um, their sort of idea of a psychologist is like a pair of jeans. Um, you know, when I pick pick the pair of jeans out, it, it has to fit. But why does Levi's make so many different types of jeans? You know, no nobody, um, not everyone will just fit a Levi's five hundred one. You know, um, and and sort of exploring that as a GP because you've already got that rapport. Um, um, can sort of help them be a bit more realistic on how they um, see see the consultation and see the fit. Julianne, you certainly have plenty of, of uh, opportunities to, to look at how the the, uh, the progression and, and how the, the course and sessions goes. When when do you feel that what we, what might be some of your strategies if you, if you think that it's not progressing as it should or it's not working well? Um, look, we usually pick that up at the after session evaluation where we say, look, you know, whether it's myself or um, somebody in the admin team, says, you know, what worked, what didn't work, did you like the person, was it what you expected? And most people are uh, very honest in giving their answer. Um, we're actually looking at an online version of that through SurveyMonkey where we might say to someone, look, we'll flick you an email um, by the internet, you know, by your, um, with the survey, we'd love you to respond, Liz, know whether the session worked. We try to do it as quickly as we can after each session rather than wait till the fourth session so that we can actually, you know, mitigate any problems before they arise and get people to, you know, engage between sessions as well that way. Um, but if it's not working well, you know, we do a bit like what Jonathan said, you know, find out what they expected, what they, you know, where they're not the right clinician. I agree. I've never used the Levi Jeans um, analogy. I use a fluffy pair of, you know, Ugg boots. <laughs> So, um, so you know, yeah, a clinician has to fit. Um, it's not about a person fitting the therapy or the clinician. It should be the other way around. We've really got to make sure we get the right person to be for the, you know, the right clinician for that person. And if it's not me, it, you know, it could be someone else that I need to know the clinicians in the area and refer them on. And we use the GP. I think Jonathan's point was brilliant. So we use the GP as that liaison to say, look, you know, I just don't think it's working. I'm not quite sure what, you know. What's going on? Could you follow it up and um, and yeah, and maintain that communication? But also, I think we've got to be. A lot of people don't know what they don't know, so they don't know what if they've never tried counselling before or therapy. But um, we we really we can surprise them. They just don't know that it's going to be like this. We ask questions that are really difficult sometimes, and I think perhaps encouraging people to keep trying to sort of have another go. Um, see how it goes. We'll get them in for a face-to-face -face if that's possible. Um, our services tried to make for our outreach people a bit of flexibility in seeing people after hours, you know, after six at night, and also on weekends if that helps with accessibility if they're coming into town for other reasons. Um, often, often it's a weekend event like football or netball. We might be available before the hour or after it, um, depending on what brings people to town. So, um, the Conrad, it's not a simple. You know, easy answer there. I think we we really try to respond well to each person's concerns. Um, but I do find the after session evaluation has given me a really good clue as to what we perhaps could change or do differently next time. And, and I think certainly that 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 points out also why why sometimes you do need to make sure that you have still got those face to face sessions happening there as well. So you really do get the opportunity to to you know re re establish that. That actual connection, that that actual therapeutic relationship, rather than have it all just being at a distance, and, and that certainly can be why it's good to space out those face-to-face -face sessions. Don't just leave them all up to the uh, to the eighth or ninth sessions, but really getting something in at the, the fourth session is, is important. Just since, of course, you know, we, we've mentioned about the the dropouts in terms of if our client um, ceases the therapeutic relationship earlier than what we might have anticipated. For their course of therapy, but of course, sometimes dropouts can be a bit more immediate than that as well. Uh, what, what would you suggest for, for therapists if the consult actually ends unexpectedly? Uh, sure, Conrad. So, if um, if people 
uh, are not if if it drops out because of a technological issue, um, then that's then that's certainly something you would address um, by having backup um, using uh, maybe a, having a second number that you can phone a phone uh, or a um, another avenue in which to contact somebody if the if the consult ends unexpectedly in that way. Um, and that the, the client would be aware of what that process is going to be as well. Um, sometimes we're having um, dropouts um, because people have left the session. Um, that, that's unusual, but it, it, it's possible that that could happen. And once again, you would have a, a backup plan for what you're going to do in that within that session um, within within that process. So um, if somebody if somebody walks out of the room, maybe they get highly distressed and they leave the consult. Um, then you, you're going to want to, um, you know, have uh, again another a number to call and, a, and a, a series of options that you would do to follow up to make sure that that person um, is getting the support that they they need, and and try and encourage them to come back to the to the session um, if that's possible. Um, I would just like to add to just in the conversations that you were having before with Julianne that um, uh, that often people don't tell you that they're not finding it very good. Although Julianne's process is, has um, is a really good one of following up with that. Often they tell you by not coming back, or that's certainly part of the experience I've seen is that people people you know I guess give you that feedback by by not re-engaging and that's a really an important time if you can't get through to people on the phone to actually make sure we are following up with the GP um, and giving them the feedback that somebody hasn't returned for the next session and um, and you know when they're coming into the next review can they please be followed up um, another another little point there um, it's really important um, is that we need to be able to Give information to people often um, over over the um, over the email or in some avenue in which you are able to actually pass information to people. Because often in, the, in a clinical room, we would hand people a handout or or give them a book to read or something that you know is they're doing for homework or following up. Um, it's really really important that we have a way to give these resources um, to people um, and. So getting consent from people is really important to use um, email or fax for in invoicing and information exchange. Um, that's just something maybe to keep in mind um, in terms of uh, stuff that's, that's useful to have consent for. Um, I've gone a bit all over the place there, but all those things are hopefully quite relevant and important. Oh, no. It's so it's so important, Cynthia, to to make sure that we do cover all of those those simple practical bases because it, it you know it's too easy for us to, to get just wrapped up in the, the the content of the of the session and not think about all those practicalities that you just take for granted when you've got your your client there in front of you and uh, you know watching for if they're starting to get distressed if they look as though they're not really engaging in therapy. Um, that yeah, you don't want to wait until you've got a silent line on the other end before you realise that they're no longer participating in, in the session. So no, that that's a, a great summary of, of some of the, of the points there. Uh, Louise, you know, we just heard from from Julianne and uh, and, and Jacinta on some of those those practicalities there as well. Um, any any summary points there for for you that you'd like to, to share with the other participants? Thanks, Conrad. Yeah, I agree with both Julianne and Jacinta that um, end of session assessments are one way of checking what's going on, and and certainly the the not showing up has been my experience too. If it's the sign that or cancelling appointments um, uh, is the sign, or leaving a long time before making the next appointment are some of the signs that it might not be working. I think also though that when we're doing telehealth, that um, some of the signs you might pick up in a face-to-face -face session that things aren't um, working too well, um, you don't have the nonverbal cues that you've got face-to-face -face and you might have to work a bit harder by 
telehealth in checking out all the time that, that, and clarifying that you are hearing what the patient's saying and clarifying with them that they've understood what, what you've said as well because without those non-verbal verbal cues you've got to work that little bit harder um, verbally to make sure that the communication's working. Um, and, and also just want to emphasise again what Julianne pointed out earlier on that um, the need to appear like a human being to the client um, and to encourage them to um, is, is really important and often it's from your lead, the therapist's lead, that they'll um, be able to see you using your hands or whatever you need to do um, to make them realise that, that um, you're more than just a, a, a person on the screen in front of them. So I think working along those nonverbal cues as well as um, end of session assessments and of course keeping an eye on cancelled appointments and um, letting GPs know if, if things are going astray very early on. Yeah, for, for sure. And Jonathan, as, as the GPs, we're often the ones who are seeing our, our patients earliest and, and making the decision to refer them on and then obviously we're the ones when the, the course of treatment has finished, we're the ones who might be there continuing the, the, the therapeutic relationship with our, our, our patients as well. What might be some of your closing summary points of, of, uh, of what we've been talking about tonight with telehealth for our mental health service delivery? Sure. Um, I really think that GPs are generally interested in our patients and we really want the best for them. So um, if you can help engage us as well as the patient, um, it's just we're just all going to work together really well. So uh, yeah, use us, talk to us. Yes, well, well and truly. And, and look, I think that hopefully what, what we've all seen out of tonight's conversation is that you know, it really is trying to, to make the whole experience as natural as, as we can, remembering that it's not the same as the, the consultation style that many of you have been accustomed to throughout your careers, but it's much, much better than not being able to have a service available at all. If you can put in that, that great preparation, we've got some fantastic templates and, uh, and checklists that are available there. If you can really identify those, those clients for whom you think that uh, service delivery by telehealth might work well, and even if thinking that it might be a specialised area of therapy that might be a little bit beyond who your immediate circle of, of, uh, of referring professionals are, that's what the professional network is all about, and looking a little bit broader as to who else might be out there who can, can work with you. But of course, what we're seeing tonight, as it did in so many times, it's working as a team uh, with our, our clients and our patients at the forefront of our thoughts that really we get the, the best benefits for them. So thank you very much to everybody in our in our wonderful panel tonight for your, for your participation. That's, uh, that's, that's been fantastic. And I, I think we really have managed to get through those uh, learning objectives quite well. Please to all of our, uh, to all of our, our participants, uh, uh, audience this evening, uh, remember in the resource tab there you will find the link to the Allied Health Professional Department of Health guidelines and, and frequently asked questions. Um, and please, you know, as I said, these, these series of, uh, of webinars cover a massive variety of, of topics. Make sure that you keep up to date with them. The next webinar that uh, MHPN will be hosting is going to be next uh, next week, next Wednesday night, Body Dysmorphic Disorder and Psychological Assessments to Cosmetic Surgery. Also in July, we've got another one coming up on bipolar disorder in youth and early intervention on Monday the 23rd of July. Actually, sorry, I think that's a borderline personality disorder, sorry. Uh, and then a very, very important one that hopefully we'll see a strong turn up for on the Thursday the 23rd of August. It's about self-care for health professionals and really that's, that's an area that's so very important to all of us. So we really do, we, we, we make sure that we remember that mental health uh, professional network is a service which is there for your benefit. Um, please make sure you do complete the, the feedback tab so we can really can continue to build these, uh, these webinars to meet your needs as hopefully we, we have tonight. Also, uh, remember that you, the, it's important that you have these networks in place in your local area as well. And uh, worth checking on the, the list to see if there's actually a, a network which is already available in your local area. 
These aren't just about one particular discipline, of course. These are multidisciplinary areas of clinicians where you can share tips and resources, build your local referral pathways, and engage in CP activities. So please contact MHPN if you're looking, if you'd be interested in, in setting up one of the, uh, the, the surveys and looking at some further online resources before we, before we go. So finally, in closing, I'd like to acknowledge the, the consumers and, and carers of uh, those who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you to everybody who logged on tonight and, and to our, uh, our panellists for your participation this evening. Good evening and we'll see you next.